Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This week's episode is called The Bully Buster. It's written by our second freelancer to appear on The Long Read in two weeks, Steve Newell. Hi, Steve. Hi, how are you going? I'm good. Uh, the story, Bully Buster, is about the Kiwi journalist David Ferrier, who I'm thinking most listeners, at least some listeners, will be familiar with. But just in case, uh, tell us who he is. Certainly. Uh, David first um, came to prominence as an entertainment reporter on TV3's Nightline. He had a, uh, a real knack for landing good interviews, ta- finding interesting takes on them, and also kind of exploring the weird and wonderful. So exactly the sort of thing you want to see at you know 10 to 11 p.m. on a weeknight news show. More recently, though, well, and I say more recently, the last six or seven years has been more of a foray into producing his own work. He had a film in 2016 called Tickled, which started from a pretty uh, David Farrier-like silly premise. He discovered something called competitive endurance tickling and then went down this bizarre and increasingly sinister rabbit hole trying to find out who was behind videos of young men being tickled. That film was somewhat of a international doco uh, sensation as befits the subject and since then he's fronted a series for netflix called dark tourist started a subscription newsletter called webworm uh, and has been recording a couple of podcasts for dax shepherd's podcast network in the u.s and the reason we're here is because he has another documentary just out It's called Mr. Organ, and again, a few listeners might be familiar with the premise here because he has written about the subject of this documentary prior. He's a pretty interesting character from Auckland, but uh, set this up a bit for us. What's this this doco about? Mr. Organ's origins, as as you say, are from some reporting back in 2016 when Farrier started uh, getting interested in some strange car clamping episodes outside a Ponsonby antique shop. (laughs) Um, there were uh, members of the public were recounting strange confrontations, uh, really exorbitant charges to get their cars unclamped. And then over the space of a few years, um, Ferry just continued to track the story. There ended up being a series of six pieces he published on the spinoff about it. And what he discovered was far more than just someone keen on making a few bucks off an improperly parked vehicle. He uncovered an individual with a pretty remarkable past and this becomes the story of mr organ so if you're familiar with the reporting on the spin-off you may uh, you may be familiar with the sort of opening exchanges in this film but certainly it becomes much more of a character study and it, it's fleshed out a lot by interviews with people that have encountered the titular mr organ over the years and um, have some pretty grueling stories to share Increasingly, though, as the story goes on, it becomes about Farrier's own relationship with Mr. Organ, and things take, as you'd expect from Tickled, some pretty strange turns along the way. Yeah, it kind of, it's it's a little bit lifting the veil in that sense. I haven't seen the documentary, but just from reading your story and knowing about Tickled, that sort of journalist, it's, he's not an auteur, but he's, you know, he is part of the story in a way that many journalists aren't. That's how he got his start. That was his his thing on Nightline. And he sort of takes that to its extreme here and talks about it to you. Like, it exacts a toll, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think there's there's sort of two things happening with um, the way that Farrier approaches his work. He gets really obsessed about particular stories. Uh, he gets obsessed about just all sorts of things. He gets obsessed about music, gets obsessed about animals, gets obsessed about, you know, people he's trying to um, expose. And also, as the title of the piece suggests, um, he's got a real thing for bullies. That's been seen in his recent reporting on Webworm that was breaking the stories about uh, Arise Church, which has been you know, well covered by other media subsequently. And we see this in Mr. Organ as well. So he, he kind of gets a sniff of, an, of unfairness um, he gets a bit obsessed about it. And then, as you say, like he 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 has increasingly developed uh, a style of putting himself in the story, which I don't think it's like an injection that's unnecessary. It, it just reflects the reality of the pieces that he's working on, that he is such a protagonist and really trying to dig and dig through what he's discovering. 
Um, and here, the relationship between himself and Michael Organ is just, it's a dance that's really interesting to watch. It's happening in Whanganui. It might have started about car clamping, but, you know, it could almost be a, a Hannibal Lecter and victim scenario and, at, at, at times. They, they do a dance around each other where both are very keen to, to get what they want. And I think it's, in some ways, a bit mutually frustrating. All right, let's hear about it then. Thanks, Steve. Here, uh, with a bit of swearing, is Karanama Rudu reading Steve's story, The Bully Buster. David Farrier's new film, Mr. Organ, has the unlikeliest of origins. A spate of overzealous car clamping outside an antique shop in Ponsonby, Auckland in 2016. The resulting documentary is not just of a clamper, but a sex shop owner, convicted yacht thief, serial litigant, and self-proclaimed prince, a man named Michael Organ. Increasingly, Mr. Organ also becomes the story of Farrier's relationship with him. Farrier tries to find out what makes Organ tick, separating fact from fiction, as he follows Organ from Auckland to Whanganui and explores his outrageous past. What Farrier finds will surprise audiences, but unfortunately for the filmmaker, he discovers he's become unhealthily close to his subject. Organ seems to relish Farrier's attention, and that of his camera, even as he feigns resentment. While clamped up car owners may have coughed up exorbitant amounts for their transgressions, Farrier learns the hard way that spending time with Organ means you pay something worse, a soul tax. This was years and years that I spent thinking about this person and them fucking with me, says Farrier. Uncovering a trail of victims left in Organ's wake, chilling accounts of intimidation and violence pepper the film, a decades-long pattern of exploiting the vulnerable. Farrier's sense of obligation to the people, sharing traumatic stories made him persevere, even when he found himself the target of Organ's ire, and finishing the film felt increasingly impossible. When we chat, Farrier is a long way from Whanganui or Ponsonby. He's on his computer in a quaint one-bedroom apartment in Los Angeles. It's no coincidence that this is also a long way away from Michael Organ. Farrier has been based in LA since 2021, when the New Zealand border closed during the pandemic. The chance to work on a new documentary in the US provided a professional opportunity to go there, but as he admits, the driving force was to get away from his prior leading man. I was fucked in the head from Michael, Farrier says. When he got to the US, he discovered the new doco he'd signed on to was a disaster. He'd promptly quit. Farrier had relocated, knowing full well there were border restrictions, but, as he puts it, he'd really just needed to get out and away from Mike. Then came an uncomfortable truth. I suddenly realised my visa was no longer valid because that was tied to the job, Farrier says. MIQ lotteries lay between him and home. Perhaps most associated with quirky, weird stories, Ferry has done a lot of investigating and interrogating of power, unfairness, and manipulation. Or as he describes it, bullies. He's drawn to people he sees bullying other people. Now, a bully was part of the reason he was stuck stateside. Bullying's a bit of a simple, all-encompassing word for it, Farrier says. But I think that's what it kind of boils down to. With Mr. Organ, it was someone that was using certain techniques to control and manipulate other people, he says. As the four years of filmmaking went by, that became directed at Farrier, eroding his original sense of invincibility. All that bullying is a far cry from Farrier's youth, which he describes as a wonderful childhood with loving parents, surrounded by every kind of animal imaginable. His dad was a vet. We had ducks in the bath, Farrier recalls. I had a pet goat that would go to school with me in Whangarei. I got this love of animals and caring for things. The family moved from Northland to Bethlehem, where Farrier attended Bethlehem College. He has warm recollections of growing up in a Christian environment. I think Christianity instilled some great values in me, he says. But emerging from religion and its linear worldview proved important for him. University let Farrier shake some of that conservatism, and he felt his world continue to expand when he traded med school for a communication studies degree at AUT, and then a part-time role at TV3. 
Having set the bar perhaps impossibly high with his first interview, Nine Inch Nails frontman Trent Reznor, Farrier became a fixture on TV3's Nightline as an entertainment reporter. I was like a kid in a candy store, he says. I could just dive into subcultures, and it was my job. Veteran newsman John Campbell says he noticed Farrier right from the outset at TV3, as Farrier swiftly progressed from curious autocue operator to full-time reporter. His audacity is brilliant, says Campbell. Even when he was 23 or so, someone big would be coming to town and he'd say, I'm gonna get that story. Why can't I do that story? And he'd get it. It's a fantastic quality. Early on at TV3, Farrier was still figuring out how to tell stories. He'd be meeting Justin Bieber or some strange band from Hamilton that he loved, but had a camera operator that refused to shoot him in any of the shots. He said, David, this fucking story isn't about you, Farrier recalls. For a year or two, that notion stuck. But then Farrier thought to himself, this is stupid. Sitting down for interviews with increasingly outrageous people, he couldn't understand why he was taking the conversation out of the conversation and so began to explore the format's possibilities. Free reign at a show like Nightline helped Farrier's late-night news exploits reach their apex. His now infamous sauna sessions interview with Conservative Party leader Colin Craig for the show Newsworthy was magnificent for viewers, yet disastrous for Craig. Some credited the sweat-drenched affair with Craig's ousting from the party leadership, though we soon learned of Craig's harassment of former press secretary Rachel McGregor. Quite what that old, critical camera operator would have thought of the sauna sessions is anybody's guess, let alone Farrier's films, in which he often takes a critical role. He'd throw them into the ocean, Farrier speculates. He'd set fire to them. He'd scream at me. Why is there so much traffic? What does local government actually do? Why is everything so expensive? What's the point of daylight saving? I'm exhausted. Where have all the forks gone in the office? So many questions, right? And in most of those cases, there's so many possible answers. So how do you find the right one? I'm Jess McCarthy. Join me and the rest of Stuff's 400 journalists for our new podcast, Stuff Explained. We'll be demystifying the big stories so you can better understand your world and what's happening in it. In an age where opinion often gets presented as fact, accurate information is becoming more precious than ever before. Find us online at stuff.co.nz slash explained or wherever you get your podcasts. Farrier found a global audience in 2016 when he tumbled down a rabbit hole on screen investigating competitive endurance tickling. The documentary, entitled Tickled, was released to worldwide critical acclaim. Opportunities beckoned and Farrier found himself travelling to some of the world's most dangerous destinations as the presenter of Netflix's Dark Taurus. It's this international audience that's allowed Farrier to work as a journalist outside the traditional news media landscape. Encouraged by New Zealand-born Hamish McKenzie to join his fast-growing subscription newsletter platform Substack, Farrier launched Webworm and now has a healthy readership split evenly between New Zealand and elsewhere. Farrier writes a lot. He publishes three pieces a week, and it means he can pay the rent in LA. It's a very expensive place to live, he says, like Auckland. The subscription income also helps cover legal fees when someone sends him a cease and desist. I love the format of it, Farrier says, because it flips the paywall scenario. The stuff I think is worthy, for instance the Arise Church reporting or what I'm writing about conspiracy theory culture, that's all free. What is behind the paywall for those that choose to support Farrier's work financially is what he calls less worthy stuff about himself. It's personal essays, you know. It's about my face blindness. But it wasn't face blindness, an affliction where someone cannot recognise people's faces, that made Farrier headlines around New Zealand this year. As Mr. Organ neared completion, Farrier was revealing abuses of power by the leadership of Arise Megachurch and implicating lead pastor John Cameron. The stuff in Arise was horrific, says Farrier, of the widespread mistreatment of interns and staff, sexual assault allegations and homophobia that he shared in a series of increasingly furious webworm stories. It was just men being manipulative pieces of shit, Farrier says, and getting away with it for years and everyone just accepting it and thinking it was okay and being absolutely under their brainwashed power. Webworm's revelations culminated in the resignations of lead pastors John and Gillian Cameron as well as John's brother Brent. 
Farrier also leaked the long-delayed and damning independent pathfinding review, grudgingly commissioned by Arise. But not before he called out other New Zealand news media. To Farrier, their choice not to credit Webworm for exposing Arise in their own reporting wasn't just territorial, but at times dishonest. They're actually not telling the story, because the story, according to the 6 o'clock news, is that for some magical reason, the church is going to look into its conduct, Farrier says, noting some media missed an integral part. Arise was desperately trying to avoid any examination of their own conduct. They only did it after a fuck ton of hounding, Farrier says. Farrier also found himself reporting on discriminatory, homophobic policies at Bethlehem College, where he'd been head boy. He wrote of the disgust he was taught to feel about anyone else that didn't fit the mould of being straight, even as he was questioning his own sexuality. Elsewhere on Webworm, he would explain why he can get so worked up writing about megachurches. I see some of myself and those leaders saying terrible things, he says, because I once thought some of those terrible things as well. When Ferry is not writing for Webworm, he walks around Los Angeles, happily carless in a metropolis where that's frowned upon. The only issue is a lack of cats to pet on the street, an important part of how he managed Michael Organ's constant presence in his head while back in Auckland. Farrier can also be heard on two shows on US actor comedian Dax Shepard's Armchair Expert podcast network. It was Shepard that stepped in when Farrier was in visa limbo. He learned of Farrier's predicament as they worked on a podcast and invited him to pitch a show. Why don't you just come and work with me, Farrier recalls him saying. I'll get you a visa, I'll sponsor you, and just stay. Farrier stayed, and that podcast, Flightless Bird, is now 20 episodes in. Each week, Farrier learns about the US one topic at a time. Tipping, baseball, game shows, juggalos. And once a month, he joins Shepard and Monica Padman on their armchair and dangerous podcast to talk conspiracy theories. To Farrier, geography no longer feels so important. He sees his audiences diverse and spread out, all on the internet and all connected. I don't feel like I live here, he says. I don't feel like I live in New Zealand. I don't really think in that way. I'll just be wherever is convenient and works best at the time. Soon that will see him back home for the cinema release of Mr. Organ and Q&A screenings moderated by the likes of John Campbell, Madeline Chapman and Toby Manhire. The film opens here after impressing audiences in the US, notably actor Stephen Fry who tweeted, I've just emerged blinking and trembling from Mr. Organ and couldn't recommend a film more highly. And don't be surprised if you see David Farrier hanging out with some cats. That was The Bully Buster on the long read from Stuff, written by Steve Newell, read by Karanama Rudu, and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was edited by Connor Scott. If you're listening via the Stuff website, you can hear this story and many more like it on the Long Read podcast, available on all the usual podcast apps. If you like what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening. Listening.